Acts chapter 15. It's an important chapter because it shows where even apostles are still human. They still have the power of choice. Their apostleship, even as apostles of Jesus, doesn't make them perfect. We'll begin with verse 1. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church. And as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. All right, right there we see an important bit of information that doesn't really get covered too often. Christians who were of the sect of the Pharisees. These are people that had been Jews as far as their religious practice went. As far as the nature of that practice, they were Pharisees. So we're talking about one of the two political groups. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and then you had the common people. And I guess you could say there was a fourth group, and that would be the priests. The priests didn't necessarily align with Pharisees or the Sadducees. And I'm talking here about the non-political priests. The political priests were doing whatever they were going to do that Rome said to do, or whatever a Pharisee or a Sadducee was paying them to do. They were in it for the power. The regular serving priest was there to serve as best they could. And these are the ones that eventually will end up leaving Jerusalem with the rest of the Christians because they will convert and there will be no serving priests left behind in Jerusalem. But in this particular instance, we've encountered a Christian whose background was that of being a Pharisee. On one hand, that's sort of understandable. The Pharisees were the ones who believed in angels. They believed in the hereafter. They believed in God in a way that the Sadducees didn't. The Sadducees pretty much sucked all the God out of God and left it as the law. And the law was their God. The Pharisees had a more correct understanding. Unfortunately, the Jewish Pharisees were obstructing the truth, the truth that was contained in the Old Testament. And we see here an example of not that obstructionism, but of the holding on to the law, as though somehow keeping the law made you better. Obviously, there's aspects of keeping the law that are still correct today. We don't go around committing murder. We don't go around committing adultery. We find these in the Ten Commandments. Doing the things that the law talked about doing for good health reasons. The truth is, doing things that are healthy, it's not a bad thing. Whether it was part of the old law or part of just how you choose to live today. But that's the thing. After Christ came, health issues, that's how you choose to live. Under the old law, when God was supposed to be leading the people, and they didn't necessarily get that, he was giving them a law that led them safely. Under the New Testament, under the teachings of Christ, we're incorporating everybody in the world. And everybody in the world has a whole lot of different dietary set up as far as their culture goes. And rather than setting up a hurdle of thou shalt obey all the Old Testament dietary regulations, it was a simple acceptance of Christ as Lord and Savior. 
meaning not just that he was going to wash us of our sins, but we would also make him Lord of our life by the way we would choose to act. So, we already see here a little bit of the problem that Jerusalem is dealing with. They're dealing with people who have converted from Judaism, who have a very strong belief in the teaching as having authority and forgetting about where the real authority for that teaching came from. It came from God. Continuing on with verse 6. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all the other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. And that's Old Testament. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogue. All right, who is the person who starts it off? The person who starts it off is Peter, the one who in a sense ushered in the Gentiles into the church. No, no, it wasn't Peter. It was God. God is the one who welcomed the Gentiles in. Peter was the one by whom God was welcoming the Gentiles into the church. When Paul and Barnabas give their testimony, they're not just giving their testimony, they're giving the testimony of God, meaning the miracles and the wonders that were shown when the Gentiles were being converted. We need to realize, just like in recognizing what Jesus said was true, not just by the fact that it agreed with the Old Testament, but also that God gave his seal of approval by signs and wonders, what we see taking place here in the early days of the church is the same. The testimony that Peter gives about the miracle that occurred when he did his part in bringing the Gentiles in, and then the miracles that had continued to follow the Gentiles with Paul and Barnabas. It shows not only had God brought the Gentiles in, but, as has been pointed out, this was fulfillment of the Old Testament. And even if they wanted to argue about what was currently taking place, even the Pharisees couldn't argue against the Old Testament that they were holding up as though it were more important than what was occurring. Let's continue on. Verse 22. Then the apostles and the elders 
with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, with the following letter. Brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us, though with no instructions from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they went and set off and went down to Antioch. When they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When its members read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After they had been there for some time, they were sent off in peace by the believers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, and there, with many others, they taught and proclaimed the word of the Lord. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went to Syria, Sicily, I mean, sorry, Cilicia, strengthening the churches. It's important to recognize two things. One, what I've already mentioned. Peter, the first one to speak up on behalf of the Gentiles being added to the church, is the one that we're going to find out in following chapters is going to change his mind. He's going to begin to be like those Pharisees, holding closer to the law because of the relationship it develops with people of importance. We also see here Paul disagreeing with Barnabas. It wasn't over scripture. It was over a choice of who to take and who not to take. Sometimes we're not going to see eye to eye. It doesn't mean that either one of them was rejecting Christianity or rejecting the truth as they understood it. It just meant that on a specific issue, there was disagreement. And in this particular instance, Paul is later going to decide, you know what? I might have been a little bit rash because we see him later on working with Mark. Sometimes we need to take a step back evaluate the situation and realize, you know what? Having a third or fourth person working with them when they went to strengthen those churches wouldn't have hurt. Paul and Barnabas could have done a good job. With Mark's help and Silas's, they could have probably done even more. As it is, two went one way, two went the other way. No harm, no foul. Both were continuing in God's work. We need to remember, even when we have those disagreements, if we're all working in God's kingdom, we need to still be parting ways in love and respect, praying for one another as we go on to do our different works. I pray you keep in God's word. I pray that you reread this chapter. 
Because like I said, it's important to identify first off that it was the Pharisees who began the problem. Those who had Pharisee beliefs before they became Christians. And those beliefs that they held before they became Christians were not what needed to be carried into Christianity. When we accept God and his word, his way, we might have traditions, we might have culture, we might have other Christian beliefs from Christian faiths that don't really follow what God's word has to say. And just because those practices are something we're comfortable with, doesn't mean it measures up to scripture. We need to be careful that, like in this instance, we don't impose things upon other believers that aren't really scripture based. We don't see Jesus while he was here in his ministry teaching the issues that we saw here at the beginning of this chapter. We need to be careful because the word we're handling is God's word. I pray you keep in it and I'm praying you're keeping healthy.